we have in our previous videos, we've gone through the other six churches, okay, that are mentioned here in the book of Revelation that are being dressed by the Lord, being written down by John on the island of Pergamos. And uh, we've already looked at six of them. There are seven total. There are a lot of sevens in this book. Okay? We looked at the church of Ephesus, and the Lord says that they left their first love. They're doing a lot of works. They're working for the church. They're working and doing this, that, and the other, and they're busying themselves. But they have left their first love. Okay? We talked about Smyrna. They're awake. And the Lord tells them to be faithful in death because they are going to face death as martyrs going through the tribulation. Okay, we also talked about, let's see, Pergamum. Perg uh, Pergamos, I'm sorry. Well, Pergamum. Um, Pergamos also had what the Lord had against them is that they had the doctrine of Baal. Okay, or Balaam. Okay, they were, um, their religion was just upside down, okay? Uh, opposite, actually opposite, okay? They were serving the wrong God, okay? And then we got to the church of Thyatira, okay? This was another Christian church, but they allowed Jezebel to come in, and Jezebel redecorated the place. Then we get into Sardis. Sardis was the high maintenance church, okay? They are Christianity by name also, but they have deceived themselves and they are a dead church, okay? Then we got into Philadelphia, and you know, the Lord, um, they were also an awake, or they are also an awake church, and they are the ones that are the five virgins when we read about in the book of Matthew that have oil in their lamps. They're waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. But now we are going to get into a church uh, that just doesn't seem to be doing that. Okay? We're going to talk about the church of Laodicea. There's a lot of things that could be said about the church of Laodicea. And I'm about to get into a couple of them now. First of all, Laodicea is kind of complacent, okay? They sort of take the Lord for granted, you know? They, he's a genie, you know, he's a genie that grants some wishes, but there's no expectancy outside of that on their part. Now, they may be involved with their church, and a lot of them are mega churches. Not all of them are mega churches, but a lot of them are, okay? The church of Laodicea doesn't really live like Christians because they've blended themselves so well into the world. Okay? They look like the world. They talk like the world. There's no difference between them. They party with the world. Okay? This is your church of Laodicea. Um, nothing about them is set apart. And the world sometimes sees these people as more wicked than themselves. Okay? There is nothing about the Church of Laodicea that the world wants. You know, before I get farther, it kind of reminds me, my husband and I, when we had first left the church, um, we don't listen to secular comedians. Typically, we don't. I think there's only one we listen to, and he's clean. <laughs> but, I mean, we don't listen to secular comedians. Actually, we don't really listen to much entertainment either way. But we were in the car, and he had, he turned on the radio, and they had a uh, about five minutes of a comedian on there. It was a woman. I can't tell you her name. I don't know. And I couldn't tell you if she's clean, dirty, or what. But all we heard was a few minutes, and boy, was that ringing a bell with us. Exactly what she was saying. So, now I'm going to take a side road here. But, I promise you, this all leads back to the Church of Laodicea. Um, so, anyway, um, I don't remember verbatim what she was uh, saying exactly. But, her skits went something like this. 
She says, you know, I was in a restaurant the other day, and I ran into an old friend I hadn't seen in a while, and she invited me to go to this really cool event they were having on Friday night, and uh, they were going to have comedians, they were going to have clowns, they were going to have this and that, and, uh, and I said to myself, mm, I don't think so, sounds like church, and then she says, you know, I was walking down the street and walking my dog, and I meet up with a neighbor of mine, and she tells me, hey, you got to come Saturday night. There's this fantastic rock concert. Oh, you got to go with me, and afterwards, we're going to have donuts. And uh, she says, mm, I don't think so. Sounds like church. And then she says, you know, and then she's like, okay, so then a couple days later, I'm working out at the gym. There's this girl next to me, we're talking, and then she says, oh, wow, you got to, we're going, we're having this event on Monday night, and, uh, oh, and there's going to be a potluck, and blah, 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 and you got to come, oh, it's going to be terrific, and she says, mm, sounds like church, okay, so that was her whole skit, is that everything that somebody would say to her, she would say, mm, sounds like church. Okay, why am I telling you this? Well, first of all, the Laodicean church has become the purpose-driven church. They've got every type of entertainment you can imagine anymore. Now they bring in magicians and clowns. I've even heard of a church in Colorado where the pastor comes down on a rope onto the stage before the rock show begins that they call worship. Okay? So anyway, the point of bringing that up is my husband and I were just like listening and we're like looking at each other like, oh, we can so relate. I'll tell you why. My husband used to teach a men's ministry, which was the only reason why we even stayed uh, with the church as long as we did. He taught it like six, seven years uh, before we left. And uh, there was a fill-in pastor at one point while they were in between pastors, I guess. And they were going to do this this little event thing that he wanted the men's group also to be a part of. And uh, and my husband's like, oh, yeah, that sounds really good, you know. And then this pastor says to my husband, he goes, okay, so what's going to be your leader? And my husband's like, well, I'm going to be the leader. <laughs> I'm teaching. I'm going to be the leader. You know? And he goes, no, no, no. You're leader. You know? What's going to bring in the guys? And my husband's like, oh, you mean a gimmick. And <laughs> he said the look on this pastor's face was priceless. Because he called him to the carpet. That's all it is. You want me to do a gimmick. And then my husband told him, he said, you know, he goes, I could do, I could pull out the three B's right here out in the parking lot. He said, hey, let's invite everybody for burgers, beer, and babes. Tell them, come down to the church, he said. He goes, I can fill this parking lot up. And that pastor goes, well, we can't do nothing like that. And my husband said, that's my point. He says, you know, I'd rather have only three guys here that want to be here than 50 of them that don't. So uh, anyway, that was the point, and so I guess that's why I brought up the comedian is because we're looking at each other like, that's it. It's the gimmick-driven church, okay? What they do is they try to drag people in by, by mingling with the world, okay? They've done everything they can to become like the world to bring more of the world into the church. Now Jesus Christ said, be ye separate. But no, this church is bringing the world in. And what do you think is going to happen to a church that brings the world in? Who's going to influence who? Well, if you do all the purpose-driven gimmicks to bring the people into your church, I guarantee you it's the world that's going to influence that church. And that's exactly what we see going on today. I don't know if I can even show this picture. I'm, I want you to take a good look at it. And if I can get this picture clip in here uh, correctly, I'm going to do it right now. And if it didn't come up, then I'm going to put it down below. I really want you to take a look at that picture because that picture says a thousand words. Now, I'm not promoting Edgar Winter. Uh, he is actually, I believe, a Scientologist. 
But that picture right there, Edgar Winter, if you don't know who he is, he's a rock musician all the way back to the classic era. He's an albino. He had a brother named Johnny. Actually, I've seen him once. Anyway, <laughs> years ago. And uh, anyway, the reason why I'm putting, his pic putting this picture up, though, is because I just love this uh, depiction that he gives. And... Um, that is a perfect example of the purpose-driven church. What they did is they took the seats out. They pulled out the pews. They brought in the more modern chairs. They got rid of the gospel music, and they brought in all modern contemporary. Okay? There's no balance. It's just that. They turn around and start opening up restaurants on their church campuses. Um, they've, they opened up bookstores and they make it open to the public so that people will come and go from the world, okay? And everybody just blends with everybody. But worst of all is when it comes to the praise and worship, instead of being a serious, humble worship before the Lord, they got pastors coming down on ropes, okay? And they got rock bands. It's a big rock production, okay? It's nothing personal between you and the Lord anymore when you do praise and worship at church. They've changed it, okay? And this is, that picture that I showed you is a perfect depiction of how mankind has just progressed along the way to where in the beginning he had respect for the Lord and then as he gets to today's world, he's the star. It's not the Lord at all. It's the, the one up there singing uh, you know, in front of the drummer and the guitar players, okay? Anyway, I just thought that was a good depiction. Okay, now, getting back to Church of Laodicea, <laughs> they are a shame to the Lord, as we'll see. Nothing about them set apart. The world sees them more wicked than themselves, okay? They make up a lot of today's churches, pretty much most your mega churches. Okay, also, um, the purpose behind the purpose-driven church was to mix the church with the world. And now there's no difference. Now you not only have the, um, you, you, you don't have people, well, let's put it this way. These are not people that are always ready to be a good witness to someone else about the Lord. No, they're just like the world, you know. An example of that, uh, somebody from the Laodicean church, you might run into some guy and he's just cussing his full head off. Yeah, yeah, you know, just, just, you know, cuss word every two seconds, you know, uh, pretty worldly. And then as a Christian, you might try to say something to them like, you know, would you like to, you know, come to a study with me? Would you like to, you know, go to, um, hey, I'm going to invite you. You want to come to church, you know, whatever. I mean, if you do have a good church. And then all of a sudden that person will stop and they'll say, well, I'm a Christian. And you'll be like, what? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I go to such and such. You know, that church destiny up the road, you know. That's your Laodicean Christian as well. Okay, another example of your Laodicea Christian are these televangelists that have private jets. They're flying all over the world. They live in mansions bigger than the churches. Okay, can you imagine that? Their families live on, on acreage of house. And uh, it's amazing. If you ever did a search online to see what on earth, how these guys live, Boy, they're living at large. But really, I mean, they've been doing it so many years, they know what to say. But do they really have a relationship with the Lord? Or are they lukewarm in their own lives? Okay? Anyway, that is the state of the, um, I was going to say, well, of the purpose-driven church. That's the state of the church of Laodicea. All holiness is gone. All conviction is gone. It's a social club now. You go there, the world comes in. Hey, they like it because, hey, it's their setting. Okay, they don't have a problem going to church with you. Hey, they don't have a problem thinking they're saved. 
Okay, that is the state of today's Laodicean church. So with that, we are going to get back into the book of Revelation. We are going to go head over to verse 14, and we're going to read about the church of Laodicea. It says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write these things, saith the Amen. So Jesus is saying, he is, he's representing himself as the Amen. Amen means so be it. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, before anybody says, oh, oh, Jesus and Satan were space brothers, okay? <laughs> I believe that that's what Jehovah Witness believes. Before you get into all that, we are going to go over real quickly to Colossians 1.15, okay? I'm going to go to Colossians 1.15. It says, He, speaking about Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, by, For by Him, Jesus Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All the spiritual realm, okay? All things were created by him and for him, okay? Jesus is the son, Jesus, son of God, is not a creation. Okay. <laughs> Just don't want you to think something else here. Verse 15, addressing Laodicea. Jesus says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's interesting. Why would the Lord rather have you be cold or hot? When I think of hot, I think of somebody on fire for the Lord. And when I think of somebody cold, I think of like an atheist. Somebody I don't want to hear nothing about it. Okay? Hot, cold. You know? And in our finite thinking, we sit here and we think, well, at least they go to church. At least they knew the Lord, they had to have, I don't know, you know, why, you know, they go to church, you know, they're familiar with him, I mean, it could be worse, right, they could be an atheist, well, that's not how the Lord sees it, okay, when you're hot and you're on fire for the Lord, you are usable, you are producing fruit for the kingdom of the Lord, okay, when you are cold, as an atheist, the Lord can touch that person's life and they can go from atheist to hot, okay? Because they've got a testimony. Some of the best testimonies that you ever hear out there are people that came to the Lord who were atheists, okay? There's a lot of testimonies, you know. I have a testimony, but I was never an atheist. But when you hear a ta atheist that came to the Lord... That is an amazing testimony. Okay? But what about the lukewarm guy? Well, I'll tell you what the problem with the lukewarm guy is. He doesn't have anything anybody wants. He's not bearing fruit. He's not even representing the Lord. You know? He's representing the place that he goes to at his social club every Sunday. He represents that. He represents all the gimmicks that they use and the trickery to get you to go there, okay? That's what they do. But uh, he has to have a relationship with the Lord. In fact, he blends more in with the world. So what he's done is, in, in a sense, he's become a cancer to the body of Christ. That's what he's done. Because now people don't, they're, they're just... Just like the Lord, you know. He says, I will spew you out of my mouth. Well, I'll tell you right now, that lukewarm person, uh, you know, it's he's, he's, he's a cancer. 
He's, he's nothing good. He doesn't represent anything good for the body of Christ, okay? He is just like the world. Anyway, let's go to verse 16. <laughs> so then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That word spew thee means vomit. The Lord says, I will vomit you out. That's a pretty serious statement. Verse 17, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods. I've got private jets. I have a home that covers my house is one acre. <laughs> I got tennis courts. I fly all over the world and I stay in the best places. Amen. Send me your paycheck. Okay, because, because, it says, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. They're building their treasure here. Okay, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Okay, what does that mean? What does that mean? When the, Lord's, when the Lord says you are naked... He's saying, you are shameful, okay? You are just shameful. Verse 18, the Lord says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. This is what he's telling them to, you know, what he's, he's telling them they need to do. Well, what is gold tried in the fire? Let's go to Zechariah. 13.9 Zechariah 13.9 It says You know what? I want to go somewhere else here. Okay, Zechariah 13.9 I made a mistake here. <laughs> Okay, here we go. It says, And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say it is my people, and they shall say the Lord is my God. They've gone through a refiner, refiner's fire okay like gold okay but these people don't care about that their gold is in this world okay next he says that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed now if you clothed if you remember we talked before about white raiment and what is right white raiment defined as in our bible pure righteousness okay that's what the Lord says that thou mayest be clothed clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear because they're full of iniquity they don't have righteousness he says and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see what is eye salve well I know what salve is I know that when you put salve on an open wound it's put there to heal it okay so what is this open wound that they've got with their eyes that they need eye salve for well I can tell you where it started if you go in your Bible to Genesis 3 5 Genesis 3 5 It says, For God doth know that in that day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. This is where the wound actually opened in the Bible. Okay? Now, when you get saved, when that bad you is transformed into a new man, and you are made a new creature in Christ, okay, your eyes should be on the Lord, okay? Your eyes should be single. It should be on the Lord. But right here, 
they got sin in their lives, okay? And the Lord is telling them, they got an eye for the finer things in life, obviously, if they, they are rich with material goods, but not rich in treasure in heaven. So the Lord is telling them to get eye salve, fix it. <clears throat> Next verse. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So the Lord's saying that when he, um, if he loves you, he will chasten you. He will correct you. Okay? And it's not always fun, let me tell you. Uh, how just how Laodicean you are before the Lord comes in and gives you that correction it can get pretty ugly okay so now let us look at um, let's look at Job 517 and it says behold happy is the man whom God corrupteth Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. You know why? You're going to go through some pain when the Lord takes you out behind the barn. But on the other side of it, he has saved your soul from hell. That's what he's done. I've been taken out behind the barn. Oh, let me tell you. Uh, when he took me out behind the barn, this went on for a few years, so I must have really been hard-headed. <laughs> and it, it, you know, you can go through the worst hell of your life, but you know that the Lord's hand is in it. You know that you are being corrected, all this idolatry, all this stuff is being taken out of your life. He's refining you, okay, so that on the other end, he has saved you. He has saved you from heading straight to hell because um, if he didn't care about you, you would not go through any of that. He would just give you over to a reprobate mind and just let you go, okay? So, you should be happy when the Lord corrects you. It hurts. Oh, believe me. When he takes you out behind the barn, it hurts. But on the other end of that, he makes a new person out of you, and there is a blessing in it. Okay, next verse. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and, and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and he will sup, and will sup with him, and he with me. That is a very nice thing. Verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Okay, so the Lord is saying that if you overcome, he'll allow you to sit with him, okay? Uh, but... If you don't overcome, he is going to spew you out of his mouth because you're not a good representation of him if you are a part of the church of Laodicea. Okay? Now, this is the really crazy thing about this church before I wrap this up. Is that the people that are a part of the church of Laodicea, they don't on the inside, they're not sitting there thinking, you know, I know I really got to get this right with the Lord. I know I really got to, I got to quit sinning. I really need to get right with the Lord and, and uh, change, I need my life to be changed. They're not doing that. They don't even know they need that. They think that they are saved. And because they go to a church that has no conviction, they don't even do altar calls anymore. They kick that to the curb too, okay? When they did this whole purpose-driven thing, this Rick Warren thing, when they did that, they made so many changes that it might as well just be the city hall building because there's nothing spiritual going on in there. Now, they may have a few good songs like Hillsong songs, which we're going to do another video on that one day. Uh, there's some bad fruit coming out of Hillsong, but they may have some nice songs, and, and believe me, there's a lot of nice praise and worship songs, but that church has no substance to it. 
Most people come out of there after their rock show and after their pep talk sermon and they leave the same person they were when they walked in. And they really believe they're saved. It's like trying to tell a narcissist that he is a narcissist, you know. It goes in one ear out the other. So is Laodicean Church. I also want to bring up one more point. And you'll probably see this when you go online. Um, I've seen this on good websites. Very good informational websites. But you will see where they argue this thing about Lordship Salvation. And what they're saying is, okay, is that we're saved by grace, and that's it. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. Now, that's true. We are saved by grace. But see, what Laodicean Church does is they take grace, and they stomp all over it. They use it as an excuse to sin, and they willfully sin. Oh, they don't quit sinning. Oh, no, they're still involved in what the world is. They're still getting drunk on Saturday night and talking about God. You know, they're still uh, meddling around in their, um, what do you call it, social drugs. Um, they're, they're just like the rest of the world, okay? And um, anyway, but they're using grace almost like an excuse for their sin. Okay, and they use it as a justification. Okay, now what people will argue is, well, the other, okay, um, okay, I'll just tell you. There's an expectancy. When you come to the Lord, there's an expectancy. This isn't just a free ride. He doesn't just pronounce you saved and because you believe, you are now a Christian. Okay, the demons believe. <laughs> they believe. They're not going to be in heaven. Okay, so people use it as an excuse. The truth is, is there is something expected of you. There really is. Now, it's not like a lot of cult religions where they say, well, you got to spend so many hours a week going door to door. You got to wear special underwear, you know. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> and you have to do all these things. Okay, no, it isn't that. But you know what? There is an expectancy from you. The Lord says that if you're a branch that's not producing fruit, you're going to be cut off. You're going to be cut off because you're not a usable branch. Okay? And so there, there is a, I'm trying to think of the word here, uh, but there is an expectancy from you. Okay? This isn't just a free ride. I have a cherry tree in my year, yard that's been out there five years. This thing has never produced. It's, uh, you know, I go out there, this thing will get like five cherries on it. And it never gets any bigger, okay? And then I have other fruit trees. So my husband and I both, we have a tendency that when we're out there watering trees, uh, we don't really pay as much attention to that tree. We'll give it a little water, but we move on. You know, especially where I live, because water, you might as well be pouring gold out of your, um, out of your hose there. It's expensive here. But, the thing is, is that I don't want to waste it on that tree, okay? I'd rather go to the apple tree or the uh, peach tree or go to those trees that are producing fruit. I don't want to waste my time standing there 20 minutes of my day watering a cherry tree. I, I just don't. It doesn't produce. I give it enough to keep it alive, but I move on, okay? Well, that's the way it is for the kingdom of heaven, okay? Or, yeah, that's how it is, you know? If you're a tree that's not producing any fruit, why should the Lord come in and sit with you? Why should the Holy Spirit be in you? You are not doing anything to produce anything, okay? So you will see online this argument between works, they call lordship salvation works-based uh, salvation, okay, or grace. Well, I'll tell you what, okay, just like they say somewhere in the middle lies the truth, well, here you go. There is an expectancy of you as a Christian. You need to be different. You need to allow the Lord to work in your life. But if you're so busy being a part of the world, he's not going to be able to work in your life because you're never going to give him the time of day, okay? So that's the point that I'm making, and that is the point of the Laodicean church. The, the point is, 
they become so much like the world that there's no difference okay and they're not even usable before the Lord so if you find that you're part of the Laodicean church or if you don't know if you are you know pray ask the Lord reveal to me Lord show me what it is in my life that needs to be worked on you know what is it in me that I need work on and he will answer that prayer speedily <laughs> okay and so uh, you don't want to be caught up as a lukewarm Christian a lukewarm Christian is a stagnant Christian he's not going any anywhere he's not doing anything hey it's easy to be a lukewarm Christian the devil doesn't even mess with you you know he doesn't mess with you because he's already got you you know he does if you're a lukewarm Christian you're on that side of the fence and you don't want to be caught there okay anyway I hope you learned something about the Church of Laodicea um, unfortunately today that is the state of a lot of churches those are the most popular churches okay uh, word of faith can be put into that category those are the ones that are increased in goods and rich and don't need anything the little guy that goes to those churches that's part of that Laodicean church is supporting that he's going to be accountable for giving money to that okay but it's not just the it's it's not just the word of faith churches uh, when you've got a mega church that's got a pastor that comes down on a rope before the rock show starts you're in a Laodicean church I don't care what kind of words come out of his mouth when he's up there on the platform he is not representing the Lord he is representing the world so with that I hope you learned something be blessed <laughs>